you know, I, I wanted to I wanted to take some time with you guys to sit down and talk about social media management, development of brand, and really the whole podcast is how we win where we are. Sure. Okay. But you guys have switched what you do. You started mm -hmm. in one facet, have switched and transitioned. So talk yes. to me about why and our listeners why we did that. Because you both did it. Yes, we both, did it. We, yes. we both switched our careers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why? Um, mainly yeah. pursuit of happiness. Okay. Self fulfillment. Yeah, if you're not uh, happy doing what you're doing, that's not worth doing it. No, it isn't. So we hear that all the time, right? And we hear, I did it. I mm -hmm. left a successful pharmaceutical career to go into something else. I thought there would be, I'm not going to say, you know, I think we all push for this drive of passion, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to find the most passionate part of our life and we're going to, it's going to be amazing. And when we make that switch, I mean, it's not roses all the time, but you left something that you weren't happy. I mean, both of you are attorneys. Mm -hmm. Correct. It was my life dream. Your life dream. Mm -hmm. Was it your life dream, Brad? Not at all. I was going to be a politician. A politician? Well, yeah. close, <laughs> right? <laughs> Went into law to be a politician, ran for office, figured out what it really all is about, left that. What did you sure. run for? I ran uh, two campaigns. I ran for local city council, and then I ran for county clerk of court. Okay. Didn't win them? I ended up dropping out early. Why? <laughs> for reasons I'd rather not say on air. Th th that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> but did you realize at that time it was like, that's not what I want to do? It's not what I wanted to do. That, that's fine. That's, that's what right. I'm asking for. Mm -hmm. So for you, both of you looked at that and said, this is what I've idealized forever. Sure. Because I think that's what's interesting to that is to me is when you guys are working with people building a brand, mm -hmm. you're tapping into people's passions right correct and you guys both walked away from what you thought maybe not well a little bit you being brad being a politician you life dream and got yes. in and went oh crap this isn't what i want <laughs> <laughs> so for me i uh age at 12 i decided i wanted to go to law school and pursue a career in the legal field uh that developed into a dream to have my own law firm build a business and eventually one day run for judge um and by the age of 25 i had graduated from law school passed the bar exam opened my own law practice and had from all accounts and purposes, a very successful looking business. Um, but it was that behind the scenes turmoil internally that uh, really caused the shift from this is my life's goal to, oh, shoot, it's not making me what, happy. What, what, was what is it going to what do? What was that though? What was that turmoil real quick? Here, I'll tell you real quick. Yeah, yeah you, know, you saw it. It's, it's real easy because, you know, when you go to court, you have all these other attorneys there and they're all gray haired and they've been doing this for 30, 40 years, right? And you see them and they're all miserable and they're all broke. Mm -hmm. You know why, when you say that, that resonates because I was going to go to law school and before I switched into psychology. Mm -hmm. Smart move. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I think what, what gets most of us is you're fascinated by the spirit of law the the mm -hmm. po the politics for you is fascinating right I was okay. political science major. sense I of it. justice for me S yes sense of justice rightness mm -hmm. correctness we're going to make the world a better place mm -hmm. than what we do and a lot of times that's what drives people like me into psychology too is figuring that out but the profession is not really the same as the art oh goodness the no. practice of any business would be great if it's not for the clients mm -hmm. and the employees <laughs> <laughs> Well, it depends on if you have good employees or bad employees. Well, that's tough. I want to come back to that in a little bit. But the but for you guys, like that sense of all of a sudden that realization of like, for me, I was talking to attorneys and they're like, don't do it. Mm -hmm. And I went in the phone book and there were 40 something pages of attorneys. Mm -hmm. And I was like, if everybody's unhappy and telling me not to do this. And I hear that a lot of people don't be an engineer. Well, okay, they're, we're going to have don't be a physician, you know, stuff like that. But this it was stark when it came to law. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So why are we turning out so many damn attorneys? Because we're being lied to. Every, every child's told that the, the main professions, physicians, attorneys, bankers make a lot of money. Okay. Maybe the bankers do, but I don't know about everybody else. <laughs> yeah. So when, was it the fact for you guys that you got out and you looked at, I mean, I know kind of listen to what y'all's ideals <laughs> are just in a short amount of time. It really wasn't about the money, but... The lifestyle. The, what was the lifestyle that you wanted? Um, well, well the, the ultimate decision actually came down to just after I had given birth to our daughter and realized that my entire life took on a new role. Um, but it was the ability to set my own schedule, to have the ability to shift things throughout my day, to be able to take care of my daughter and her needs when they needed to be taken care of versus being in court uh, for, for a lot of my cases, everything would be set at 9 a.m. 
every single defendant, if it was a criminal case, would be set at 9 a.m. And you were just sitting there waiting until your, your name was called. And so you may be waiting two, three hours just sitting there in court, twiddling your thumbs or trying to do some emails. But it was a really, it felt like a, a, a waste of my time. Hmm. Kind of a hurry up and wait mentality. Oh, Very yeah. much. Oh, yeah. Very much. Mm-hmm. And, and for you, the political side, the fascination that drew you to politics was what? Oh, I grew up loving politics. It was, um, I was seven, I think it was in the 92 election. And I remember my mom took me into the polling booth with her and she explained to me, this is an amazing country. We have you know, rights here. And you know, this is, these people, you have to respect them, whether you agree with them or not, because they're putting themselves out there for everybody to judge. Mm. And that got me, I love C-SPAN. I remember my mom would tell me, you know. You and my dad. I was like 13 <laughs> and I have insomnia. And my mom would say, you need to watch C-SPAN at night and knock you right out. It turns out it worked for our daughter. Because oh. we watched the impeachment hearings the oh, other yeah. week, just knocked her right Straight out. Straight out. Um, yeah. But me, I, I would be up all night to like four, like, this is fascinating. Did you see these committees? This is so cool. <laughs> really? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so is it the the lifestyle that changed for you was the realization that this didn't match what you really wanted? Um, part of the lifestyle, but also finding out that the practice of law was not everything that it's made out to be in TV, movies, and even the stories you read about in the newspaper. Um, what is it really? What is it really? Clu- it's clue us in because people who are listening to this don't know. <laughs> a lot of research and writing for one. Okay. A lot of research and writing. Um, the the hour long courtroom dramas that you see on television. They never happen. They never happen. Um, about ninety five percent of your cases never actually go to trial. Um, so it's a lot of negotiating. So you wanted you wanted to be a trial, getting in there, mixing it up, the competition. Yeah. Certainly, she was pure trial attorney. I was the research attorney. Mm -hmm. So um, if anybody is familiar with the European style of of law, there's solicitor and barrister. One does the research and writing, one does the actual verbal arguments. And Mm. that's the division that we had in the practice. Um, It's just, it spoke to our natural abilities. Yeah, I'm about to say, I can see Mm -hmm. that. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And and it worked very well for us. But even even that, um, it didn't give me what I thought I was going into. So you wanted to be in the heat of it, the the competition. Yes. I, mean, you gotta, I gotta believe in a trial attorney stage, the competition gets your heart rate up. Oh, it does. Coming off of being a, a student athlete in college yep. and being an athlete throughout my childhood, I I live and breathe for that type of, of camaraderie and uh, competitiveness. Yeah. So when you start getting settled, it was like, we're not going to play the game. We're just going to give the outcome. Oh, we had we had pure winners. Cases that would have won if we had been able to take it to trial. And you take it to the client. And you say, you know, we're most likely to win. There's no guarantees in life. And are we talking criminal? Or are we talking civil? All anything? of it. All, All of the above. We did a okay. lot of it. Okay. And the client would say, well, I'm not willing to risk, you know, in the case of criminal, my freedom, even though we, we know we're going to win. All right. Let's talk about that. Okay. Because... That risk that yeah. people live in every day mm-hmm. is a lot of times what steals our passion. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. yes. Because in the grand scheme of greatness, we look at things and we go, oh, it's going to be so great. But not that risk is what we live our lives by, right? I mean, we all want these desires, but can you sacrifice? I mean, people are talking their freedom. Right. I don't think most people are willing to risk. <laughs> and I think that's why you have so, many, so few uh, entrepreneurs in the world. Oh, 100%. People want the entrepreneur lifestyle, but they don't want the entrepreneurial risk. Well, they want the money. They don't know what comes with it. Yeah, but they don't realize there's not a lot of money there. I mean, do you think entrepreneurs are the same way as kind of like lawyers? I mean, people want to open up a business and this new idea, and they realize that you know 99.9% of them fail and they're broke. 80% fail in the first five years, and, and the remaining 20%, 80% of those fail in the next five years after that. So, yeah, most people fail. But it doesn't mean you, you don't have something good out of it. I mean, yeah. one failure doesn't necessarily mean you're done. You, you pick it up and go to somewhere else. Right. So you guys made this switch. Mm -hmm. Okay. I I can imagine the phone call to your families. (laughs) The Uh, politician's going to say, no. (laughs) So it it was a little easier for us because um, Diana really made the decision after having our daughter. And it Mm -hmm. was right after having our daughter. She looks down at this baby in her hands. It was just placed there, looks up to me and goes, I'm not going back to work. And it was the first grandchild on both sides of our families. Um, So I think both of our mothers kind of understood that that maternal need to be nurturing and Mm -hmm. step away from the 120 hour weeks that we were putting in. Is that, uh, I'm gonna go there. Is that unfair to a female attorney? Expecting? The The demand. 
No, I don't think so at all. Okay. Why would it be unfair to a female and not a male? No, no, no. Well, because most of the time the male doesn't, I'm, I'm going to play a, a bad gender role here, but okay. um, a lot of times the male is not going to have to be expected to be the one at home. Sure. And having daughters, I know that that's a risk. I mean, I see it with my professional female athletes. My professional female athletes, in their mind, if they want to have kids and family, now like the LPGA Tour is brilliant at helping them out from a daycare standpoint, mm -hmm. but the husband's not the one staying behind at the hotel taking care of the kids for sure. the most part. On the PGA Tour, it's the wife staying behind. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm saying is mm -hmm. it's like having daughters and having a, a successful wife. She's My wife shared that sometimes. Like she didn't go to med school because she wanted to walk away from her career and raise kids. Mm -hmm. So she became a nurse. Mm -hmm. And she and, and so it's always hit me of like, I mean, I think anybody, I mean, listen, I don't think you have to be a male or female to be a fantastic parent if you want to be the stay-at-home parent. I think that's not what I'm implying. What I'm saying is I think sometimes for the maternal, the biological drive is stronger in the female to nurture. We know that. Sure. Sure. I can absolutely agree with that. And then you also have other other parenting decisions that come into play, such as breastfeeding. Yes. Uh, for me, I breastfed our daughter until she was two. Uh -huh. That was a, a large time commitment. And it was essentially every single hour. I couldn't be going to court yes. and, and still That's what I'm talking giving about. That, that nurturing and love to my daughter. And to keep her, and you guys have her with you. Mm -hmm. She's very... Always. Always. Yes. She's been going to meetings with us since she was maybe... Six th weeks. Three weeks, right after she got off of the machines. Because she yeah. went out with me. You were you were at home. Yeah. yeah. So, mm -hmm. and is that a choice that was from the, the, the developmental, or was it a practical decision? Both. A little bit of both. Both. One, mm -hmm. it's exposing her to people is great. Exposing any child to people in, in situations they're not familiar with is a fantastic mm -hmm. thing to do. Two, um, we both needed our sanity. So to <laughs> give the child to somebody <laughs> was a good thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm an, I'm an only child, and I, I was raised in the environments all the time. So never went to a babysitter's house if my parents had a party. Mm -hmm. I was there, and mm -hmm. I had to behave and interact and socialize. So I completely agree with that. Um, I, I, I think it's completely un it's, it's one of the understated rules of socialization of our kids that if we go to a restaurant, it's not everyone else's responsibility to raise your kid. Right. You know, the my expectation always with my kids were they were going to sit at the table and if somebody's having an anniversary dinner next to them, they wouldn't even know. Mm -hmm. My kids were going to be entertained, but not, you know, not necessarily by other stuff. Um, so, so you guys uh, in, in doing this, make that switch, walk away from a successful practice and mm -hmm. think, I've got this idea. I mean, you fall, I mean, entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. yep. but you walked away from what you're trained to do. Oh, yeah. So when, when you say what you're trained to do, law school doesn't train you to, to lawyer. It trains you to think like a lawyer. Okay. This so is true. It's, it's not exactly a practical course. It's more intellectual. You don't graduate law school knowing what the law says at all. You have to actually go out and study the law to be able to represent clients. Nobody's ready to represent a client the day they walk out of with their law degree. Yeah. It's much like doing what I do as a psychologist. Mm -hmm. I mean... You, you get some experience, but until you're out on your own and you're making your own decisions, you don't have a clue, right? Mm -hmm. Sure. And it was it's, it's a critical thinking degree. Yes, it, it's a critical thinking degree. And it really wasn't a, a far you know, leap for us to go to business coaching because we were business law attorneys. Mm -hmm. We were representing and doing contract review and seeing all the business in action. And I, I would like to say that I was a wet blanket as an attorney because my job was to say no. And I would, you know, people would come to me and say, what are we allowed to do? And like, no, you can't do that. No, you can't do that. No, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. But as a business coach, it's fantastic because I can say, yes, you can do, but talk to your attorney first. Okay. <laughs> so do you all maintain your legal license? Nope. No. no. Is, that a, is that because of like not a conflict, um, like a dual role mentality? A lot For, of people, once they find out we were attorneys, start do they do ask us legal yeah. questions, mm -hmm. and we don't want to answer that. That's what I'm asking. Yeah. Like, like oh, real quick, can you answer this for me? Yeah. yeah. No. Plus, um, so I was only licensed in the state of Ohio, and since we're not there anymore, it really makes no makes sense, sense to keep that active. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, all right. So you guys look at entrepreneurs. What are the major risks that you guys went through, but also counsel your clients? I'm going to use the word counsel, but... Um, recommend or see that they struggle with on building brand, building success, and things like that? Uh, marketing plan. You have to have a marketing plan. If you don't have a marketing plan, you're going to fail from the beginning. Okay, <laughs> describe that because that, that, that I agree with you, but I want to di dive in. Okay. okay. When, when people say marketing plan, I, you know, what I hear initially is, um, how are we going to get people to hear about us? 
So we're gonna print out brochures. And if you go to most marketing agencies, what are they, what's the first thing they do? Gotta build a website, gotta get brochures out. Okay, 1982 is over. <laughs> okay. So you what still need we, a website. <laughs> you, you, do, you do. You do, but that's... It's I, not the same type of website it's anymore. It's not. And that's what I'm saying is like people are always like, we got to build a website. Website is a billboard unless it's something. Mm-hmm. That's right. Okay. And most people fall into the trap of the billboard. It's like we spent 30000 I mean, I've got buddies who, who've been like, I spent $25,000 on a website. I'm like, what did you get out of it? Did it do anything for you? Mm-hmm. Oh, it looked pretty. It's already out of date. <laughs> You know, mm-hmm. so talk to me about that. Uh, can you reiterate the original question? The, the marketing plan, what's needed there? Okay, what's, uh, well, business really comes down to two things. It's marketing and sales. Yes. If, if you don't have marketing and sales, you don't have a business. If Correct. you don't have a product to sell, you might as well just be on the, on the street, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but if you don't have a way of getting people to know that you have something to sell, that's the marketing side, you're never going to sell those things. So you have to know those two aspects of your business. And that's that's the fundamental of all business. So marketing plan really comes down to how you're going to get in front of people. Uh, but it's, it's more than that. It's how is your uh, your product packaged because you were, you wanted to talk about brand. We don't yeah. do branding. Yeah, we, we have a, a gentleman we refer to, David Tyreman. He's a world famous branding consultant. Mm-hmm. Um, and he'd be able to speak on that. But if you don't have an entity or something that people recognize as relating to you, then it, you're just one of the thousand other people selling the same thing. Because you know, a original book hasn't been written in what 400 years. Even yeah. Hamlet was a ripoff of you know three books before that. Right. <laughs> yeah. No, there's no new movie. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, every movie's following a, something. There's a new one. And for the most part, all products are exactly the same. 100. percent So it's how do you differentiate yourself from somebody else and their product? And and largely it comes down to your personality. Oh. People don't buy products; they buy from okay. people. Come on, keep keep going here. Mm-hmm. Now we're getting into my field, psychology. <laughs> yeah. Keep going. Now. I love preacher. psychology. You okay. know, we could riff all. Yeah, yeah let's go. <laughs> let's go. Come on. Um, let's do it. So it, it's an attractive character. If, if you're not somebody that people li- know, like, and trust, those are the three buzzwords you hear in business a lot, mm-hmm. know, like, and trust. If they don't like you, know you, trust you, they're never going to buy from you. Um, and it's in today's digital age, it just comes down to quantity. Yeah. How, how much are you putting out there? And a lot of people, what we see, especially on the social media side, is people think just by having a Twitter account, by having a LinkedIn account, having an Instagram account, they're doing something right. But it's like a, it's the same as the website. It's just a billboard. Mm-hmm. You really have to be working it the right way, playing to the systems, playing to the algorithms in order to really have any presence anywhere. But that's so overwhelming. It can be. Being from a business, it absolutely can. Be. I mean, being a business owner. I mean, you know, we've been in business ten years, and and took a, a, an aspect of psychology and made it a little bit different and the application of it's a little bit different. But most people in psychology don't do what I'm trying to do, which is a lot of social media and experience. It's, it's you know, I'm not making claims that I'm better than anybody else, but what I'm doing is like, I, m- one of my ultimate goals was to destigmatize mental health in a way that if people come to see me from a performance standpoint and they have a good outcome, 10 years later, if they're having a problem in their life and they go, man, I remember working with Brett, that was really helpful. Let me go reach out to somebody. Let me see who he recommends, mm-hmm. right? And so that's why I've always gone on the social media is like it's content is king. Content mm-hmm. is king, mm-hmm. yes. Yes, it is. However, there's got to be a second side to that, right? So it's, it's the, uh, the call to action. So yeah. you, you can put out as much content as you want, but if you're not actively trying to sell, which is that other half I'm talking about. That makes people so uncomfortable, doesn't it? Well, that's their problem. You got to get over it. <laughs> I guess you're right. I mean, either you're broken living in a passion that you don't love. Exactly. Mm-hmm. You know, if, if you're not, you can market as much as you want. You can put out a, a five videos a day on YouTube, the second largest search engine in the world. It could be perfectly keyworded, perfectly tagged, and you know, people would find it. And it could get hundreds of thousands of views. But if you're not selling anything that they can get to, that doesn't matter. So where do the, what are the mistakes that people make there? Um... I think one of them is not realizing that everyone is a salesperson in some capacity. You mentioned that uh, sometimes sales can get a dirty rap or yeah. or people don't think of it as an honorable career, but we're all doing selling every day. Whether my, it's My two-year-old sells. Yes. yes. Every single day she tries to get me a cookie from me. I'm like, no. She'll give me a reason. But, but, but this, is, this is a great point because when I was in grad school, I was a bit... I was going to go to law school as a business major, but then I went into psychology very late. But I was always fascinated by the business side of psychology and the business application of psychology. I mean, marketing is psychology. It's so cool, isn't it? Yeah. William James was one of the very first marketing professionals we had. He was a psychologist. And the when we look at selling, people, you know, again, I would be talking to my colleagues in psychology who, if, if, if other psychologists are listening to this, it's okay to say this. Most psychologists are typically somewhat passive. 
it makes them great therapists and great listeners. And But they're typically a little bit, I'll stand one step behind. Whereas attorneys are typically, y'all are trained to be more aggressive. You're gonna push. I'm not saying you're conflict desirers, but you can have, psychologists are more gonna, it's just probably the nature so of it. So on the attorney side, for the most part, attorneys really aren't allowed to advertise too much. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it, it's a, a very delicate balance. Here in Nevada, we're in Las Vegas at the moment. Yeah. Um, they, they're not allowed to advertise at all unless it gets passed pre -approved. through the bar. Yeah, you have to get pre-approved for anything, even a Facebook post, you have to get pre-approved on. And you have to pay for each uh, approval. So oh, if you wanna make a post on Facebook, you have to pay to have somebody review it before you can even post it. Where in Ohio, we didn't have that issue. We oh, were able to just post whatever we wanted. Yeah, I think Louisiana and Alabama on the interstate, you can post whatever. I mean, right. every there's a joke in Alabama that every billboard is owned by Alexander Shannara. <laughs> <laughs> but his, I mean, I've heard, I've heard rumors that his monthly ad budget is seven figures. Oh yeah, there's a few attorneys here in town that mm -hmm. have seven figure ad budgets just for billboards. Mm -hmm. But so if you're turning are. a profit on that, but, but, why not? But, okay, I agree with you. Okay, I'm a capitalist. And I do want to get back to your question about the, what can psychologists do, so yeah, yeah. we'll get there. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna get there. <laughs> and, and listen, I'm not, I don't follow a script, I don't send questions ahead of time, this is why, <laughs> yeah. because I love these dialogues. So, but you're talking about sales, right? And sure. when I was in grad school, I kept saying, guys, we sell every day, and people are like, oh no, we don't. I'm like, yes, we mm -hmm. do, we're an asset. And for people who are listening to this podcast who are a lot of coaches, there are a lot of parents, there's CEOs of companies and people who listen to it, but kind of got pulled in because of the sports angle. Mm -hmm. Coaches in high school, you're selling every day. Mm -hmm. You may not be selling more t-shirts, but you're selling people to buy into you. And I think that's what's fascinating. Like if we look at the college football world right now, Dabo Sweeney is winning the marketing game. Mm -hmm. People want to play for him at Clemson because of how he portrays and how he probably is authentically behind the scenes, but his social media is selling him as, come play for me, it's a family environment, we're all in, and all that. That's selling every day. Mm -hmm. It is, mm -hmm. and it's, it's focused on giving. Selling is really focused on giving. Okay. If you can give more, you'll be able to sell more. Okay. Get to so uh, to get back to your psychologist, what can yeah. psychologists do? Say they put up a video on, on YouTube, and I said you have to have a call to action in order to sell something. You don't necessarily have to say, buy my book, it's 1999. You can instead say, hey, I have an article on this topic we just talked about in this video. You can download it for free from my website. Now they go to your website, they put in their email address. Now you have their email address in your system, and you can follow that up with, hey, I have a discount on my book. It's 50% off through my you got emails. Them in a funnel now. You, yes. you do follow up and sell them through that way, through a funnel. Okay, so let's talk about the call to action. A lot of people, we're talking about passion, right? Mm -hmm. We started this whole conversation about you guys leaving something because the passion didn't follow what you thought. Sure. That to me and call to action are very similar. Oh yeah, you have to find your people, your tribe. Okay. So mm -hmm. it comes down, to, there's what, seven billion people on the planet, there's 300 and 37 million people in the United States alone. Um, there's a lot of people here. You don't need to sell to all of them. You only need to sell to the people who are gonna buy from you. So if you can go out and find those people who have the same passion as you do, who resonate with your personality, it's a much, much, much easier sell. Do you find this hard, and I'm gonna look at you for a minute, Dan. Sure. With the professional athletes that you work with. I'm not asking you to divulge who you work with, but, mm -hmm. but their thought, right, having worked with a lot of professional athletes is, is that they get, I, I find one of the major traps they have, and we talked about this on the phone coming in is, they they forget where their 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 drive their money game is. Sure, sure. They get distracted. So they started playing a sport because they love the sport. Yes. And they continue to do it because they love the sport, but then they start making money at it. It becomes more of a job for them, and a lot of times they can lose that fire that originally made them love the sport in the first place. Um, and they never seem to think of themselves as salespeople. I'm an athlete, not a salesperson. Okay, can you, can you talk about that? Because we, like one of the things that we struggle with in our business is what's our product? Mm -hmm. Okay, our podcast is a product, but it's free. Mm -hmm. Okay, but we do, there's a lot of reasons why we do the podcast, and thank y'all for listening. Um, but we do the podcast because it was a way for me to share information with people that I find interesting. Yeah. That's the whole drive. If, I'm, if I find people interesting, I want them on the podcast. If I don't, you gotta really commit to me as to why I need to have you on the podcast. It's a self-fulfilling thing for me, okay? okay. I, I wanna learn. That's why I'm here this morning. I wanted to learn from y'all. And the podcast is my tool. But the product, if my product is my one-on-one -on -one sessions, I only have so much time in the day. Mm -hmm. The same thing with a professional golfer. Very true. Mm -hmm. So how do we monetize that without distracting from where our core is? You charge more. 
<laughs> but there's a point there, right? I'm with you. Okay. Well, I, and, in which and, case, you would, you multiply your time. Okay. So you and, find and, some way to do you sell something that can be sold over and over and over and over again without needing to, you to be there. But do you come across like an ass if you start if you price yourself out of the general population? Well, you don't have to sell to the general population. You only have to sell to the people who are going to buy from you. Your tribe. Hmm. Then you can sell however much you want because if they're willing to buy, they're willing to buy. Mm-hmm. But how do we deal with the criticism of social media? Because oh, is it, so because, criticism's a fantastic thing. I love criticism. I love people who hate on me. Okay, you love politics. No, I love, <laughs> people, I love haters. I love people who are going to hate on me all day long because they're commenting on my stuff. They're commenting on my stuff. They're commenting on my stuff. That helps me in the algorithms. It does nothing but good things for me. Oh, yeah. The, the haters are often more engaged than your top fans. Oh, there's no doubt about that. I've, mm-hmm. I've heard 10 haters. You know, one hater's worth 10 followers, That's 10 right. lovers. I just got a, an email or a, a DM yesterday with somebody who just listed all the things wrong with my Twitter account. Like, you know, like, hello, I wanted to give you advice. Just, here's all the things wrong with you. Like, Thank you. Some of those things were good ideas. I decided to, to work with it, but you okay. have to love your haters. You have to throw it your side. Okay, but that's so hard from a psychological standpoint because we know the psychological, I mean, Instagram is changing their value of a like. Mm-hmm. And be, why? Possibly getting rid of it. Why? Um, so it's not a, a bit of an addictive feature. Oh, it's not a every, bit. You, 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 <laughs> Everybody like, oh, wants to. I got to another just... notification. Oh, another notification. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's tapping into the part of the brain that a human connection taps into. Lots of dopamine. Mm-hmm. A lot oh, of dopamine. Every time. Yep. And it's what's keeping Vegas going. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, mm-hmm. you walk through, I mean, it's, it's basic. The flashy lights. Psychology 101, which is funny. <laughs> Facebook's doesn't. Facebook's changed over the years. It was much different when we first picked up Facebook in our law practice. But back, we, I call it the wild west of online social media advertising because we just, sure. we had, when we first started, we had this junky little just flyer with her face on it and said, just call us more or less. Here's our phone number and the legal description. And when you say flyer, you meant a post on Facebook. It was just a picture. It looked like a little flyer, yeah. a digital flyer. And our phone just started ringing off the hook. We just posted it in groups. Back when you could post in groups and get tons of people to yeah. see it. Nowadays, if you want to build a group, you want to build a page, you have to pay for it. There's almost no other way to do it's it. It's really not organic anymore. Yeah, no. not at all. But Instagram still has a little bit of the organic to it. Twitter's very organic. There's other platforms still coming up right now that are more, much more organic, like TikTok. I love TikTok. But it's no one really knows how to manage that. What, what, okay. Remember who's listening. <laughs> I see. You know what I hear about TikTok? I hear TikTok and Snapchat like, Dude, I'm too old for that because if I'm on that, that's creepy. <laughs> um, so it is interesting. So I do dad jokes. That's my, my TikTok because I have found the demographic that seems to like my videos on TikTok are 12-year-old girls. So I have to keep it as clean, squeaky clean as I possibly can. Okay. <laughs> but the, re- the reasoning I'm still working at and getting lots of these 12-year-old girls to follow me is because eventually the numbers just look good. Mm-hmm. The number of follower count, my follower count is going to look fantastic. So even everybody if your else doesn't match your business. It's, it's mass psychology. Everybody else is going to see my numbers and go, "Oh, he must know what he's talking about." So I can then switch to something else and market. Plus, I will also add to that: just because the demographic of TikTok is one set of the population today, doesn't mean six months from now that demographic's still not going to be the same. We want to have an established presence now while it's easy to build, because the rest of the the population is going to eventually make its way. To to that platform if the platform survives. Facebook's the perfect example of that. It was started as college kids yeah. and now it's 50 plus. Yeah, he was, he was, you were, I mean, you guys may have been in college during that time when yep. it was, yeah, mm-hmm. I wasn't. Mm-hmm. Um, and it came to us and it was like, oh, wow, look, I can connect That's with my way grandmother. to connect with your old friends is yes. what that was. Yeah, 100%. So, but, but to me, oh God, it's overwhelming. <laughs> it's a little overwhelming. There's a lot of different platforms. I really recommend YouTube. YouTube's number one. Oh, yeah. And then, after that, it really depends on where your audience really it's, sits. It's funny, and I'm looking at Brett in this. We, we eventually got to just get him on a camera or on a, a mic because I always refer to I feel like he's like my uh, Ed McMahon type of thing. Um, <laughs> but how long have I been saying video content is king in our business? And how long has it taken for my employees who are no longer with us to understand that? Remember what I said earlier? One of the biggest pains of doing the business is employees and getting yep. people to mm-hmm. buy in. Mm-hmm. How do you get people to buy in who don't? Because social media is as hard as sending people out on the streets and filling mailboxes. So this, this is hard to hear. And it's hard for a lot of people to really to wrap their head around. You, you hire quick and fire quick. You just have to be willing to let people go if they don't match your company But culture. I worry about my reputation. I'm There's a lot of I'm coming people in, out I'm there. coming into the counselor's office. There's now. a lot of people out there. Yeah, there are. As long but, as you have insurance, you're good. Yeah, we have that. <laughs> but... <laughs> <laughs> I'm very practical. <laughs> uh, yes, you are. But 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 
y'all's reputation is important for people to hire you though, right? Like my reputation, I don't want people to go around and thinking Brett's the biggest asshole there is because he demanded a lot. But so then what happens is then I'm angry and frustrated all the time. No, if you're demanding a lot of your employees in order to give the best outcome to your clients, that's different than if you're demanding a lot of your clients. Yes. So I don't think your issue is that you're getting a bad reputation with clients. You're getting a bad reputation as being a, a poor manager. Yes, thousand percent. So then you have to explain, no, I got rid of them because they were not the best person to fit my business model. Mm -hmm. And just because you're firing quickly doesn't make you a poor manager. Yeah. In my opinion, it makes you a good one because you're quick to realize that that person does not fit with your, your company culture. Yeah, I'm looking at Brett. He's the only, he's our last remaining besides my daughter and my <laughs> wife, okay? So he's the only one that doesn't have blood in this. Um, but Brett is the most resourceful guy we've ever had in our business because he'll teach himself anything. Mm -hmm. He'll reinvent himself in an instant. He'll educate himself, and he's always trying to find out what the customer needs. And that's a very, very rare quality to find very in an rare. employee. 100%. And, and I don't even like to use the word employee with him because it's more like a team member and, and because or a teammate because to him, he's, he's thinking ahead of me. And if he says, hey, we need to do this, I'm in on that. It's not like, hey, we need to do this because it's less work on me. Mm -hmm. It's we need to do this because this is what's right for our customer. But I, I like, okay, l let's shift here a little bit. Sure. Um, this is why I don't do therapy because I can't stay on one topic for 45 minutes. <laughs> um, I, this is why I coach now because I can be aggressive. Um, but I've got a, I, I can tell you right now who's listening to this. I've got a high school baseball coach, okay, mm -hmm. at uh, an average public school. Okay. who's trying to build support and he's going to go, what the hell do I need social media for? Hmm. Well, boosters are a thing, if I recall, call, unless they got oh, rid yeah. of them. No, they're no, a thing. You need so, fundraising money. You need so fundraising if money. you get the parents in the community, if you just get the community at large to see what's going on, you get to see the team giving back. It, mm -hmm. it just creates that, that personality I mentioned earlier. It's the ability to see what's going on behind the scenes. I, it drives me nuts to see golfers all have the same exact picture over and over and over again on, on Twitter and Instagram. It's that backswing, like just like that, over yeah. and over again. And it's like the, the prototypical golf picture. What about your family? What's your family doing? What did you do for Christmas? Do you got any plans for New Year's? That's the stuff your audience really cares about. So one of the ones and, and, and that I love to follow, and, and I know Ian, but Ian Poulter does a brilliant job. He'll get roasted on social media for getting mad at somebody for doing something. But he's actually a wonderful guy. I don't know if you, you don't have to, whatever. But he is brilliant at showing his family. Like, <laughs> hey, here's our elf. Hey, here's our ski trip. Mm -hmm. And I know some other, some other people are going to go, oh, that's giving way too much to our people. Mm -hmm. that's, to our, that's opening up and exposing my family to. They want that wall. They, they want do. the wall between their professional life and their family life. In this world, it doesn't exist anymore, it's, does it? No. That work-life balance doesn't exist. It's, I don't you just think have it's a real balance in your life. You don't have a work-life balance. It's just yeah. whatever you have to take care of now, take care of it. I always laugh at companies who say we value work-life balance. What that means is we're going to work you to the bone and we're going to use lip service. I mean, seriously. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I think work-life balance is, is not something that needs to be advertised. It's just something that needs to be lived and evaluated. But Sure. Um, like we, we bring our daughter to work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, no. She, I, goes, she goes to client meetings with us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You were going to say something? I was actually going to jump back to your baseball coach listener who, who um, had another point about another piece of value that he has by running social media is he's giving back to his players because these high school players, they're going to be looking, some of them are to go to college mm -hmm. and recruits can only go to so many events. They're only going to see so many players, but if you're giving them a leg up and f highlighting them on social media, you're doing the players a huge service by opening them to views by colleges or professionals. So, okay. So here's the next question. Short of hiring you guys, where does somebody go to learn? Because I'll tell you, like, my daughter, I love her to death, but she's like, you can't post to Instagram because what you're posting is not matching your demographic. In other words, like, she teases me. She's like, I'm going to train you better. But she's like, your stories, let me handle that. Because sure. it, 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 there's a certain element of a, I mean, he's, Brett's nodding his head. I mean, yeah, he I'm is. not good at it. I mean, you know, this, I have the perfect website for you. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll spell it out. It's uh, G O. O-G-L-E dot com. Yeah, that one. So you go to Google <laughs> yeah. um, or YouTube. It's the world's second largest search engine. Every day, it's like 100 million new videos are posted on, on YouTube. It's a ridiculously large number. That's his education. Yeah, ridiculous large number. And I mean, I post stuff every day. She posts stuff every day. We're teaching people. There's people out there trying to teach people. And yeah, they're going to try to sell you because that's the point. But they're teaching you. That's It's the University of YouTube. 
You can learn anything there. Mm -hmm. You don't have to pay for it anymore. Y'all hearing this? <laughs> I, I mean, and, and I'm not trying to be funny, but Brett has taught himself video editing, audio editing, website design. I learned Photoshop because I was mad at her one night. She went out to the bar. I got to my computer like, I'm going to learn Photoshop today. <laughs> and it took me four did years you, to did you get show good her? at it. Did you show her? <laughs> That's right. He's got mad graphic design skills now. <laughs> that you? night out at the bar was worth it. It was worth it. <laughs> yeah. But where is this going? Oh, that's, who knows? Because even 10 years ago, no one thought it was going to be here. And then 10 years before that, we barely had the internet. Yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. So it's, we're currently in the influencer economy. If you're not an influencer, then you really don't have a, a business today. 10 years from now, you know, with AR, VR coming along mm -hmm. and everything going digital and everything being automated, who knows? And year after year, you just see the numbers continue to increase. More sales are moving from brick and mortar to online. Everything is moving to an online community uh, for social interactions as well as shopping. It's, it's just going to continue to grow. So if you have a young a college kid who just, well, I mean, not, not only that, a college kid who's in college, mm -hmm. okay, he's playing sports. And he's like, I got to develop my brand. Mm -hmm. Do we want them developing their brand or their game? Mm -hmm. Why not both? Why not you know, no, so film yourself there. while you're doing your, brand, your game? Mm -hmm. That's all you have to do. Explain what you're doing, how you're doing it, why you're doing it. A lot of what we try to do is uh, net activities, no extra time. So figure out how you can take what you already do and work that into your brand image to be knocking out two birds with one stone. Okay, so let's go back on me for a minute. All okay. right. So I want you to put your hats back on as attorneys at law. Okay. I'm not going to ask you business legal advice. I just want you to go, could you film your interactions with your clients because that's the problem i have right my clients give, come yeah, to they, me if they sign a waiver yeah but that's a weird comment then because like if I'm, I'm gonna use this as an example if i'm a hitting coach in baseball or i'm a golf pga it's so common for you to say hey i've got so and so who's a pga tour winner look at his before and after swing mm -hmm. but who wants to do that with their psychologist <laughs> you so, see the problem i, I have to be quite honest if, if an athlete were to get on film with you and be willing to post that stuff on YouTube, it'd be phenomenal content for it'd them. It'd be unbelievable. It'd be phenomenal because people would be really diving into who they are and they'd, they feel for them. That's the thing. You have to, it's not logically that it's, logic doesn't matter. People don't care about logic when they come to, to sales and following people. It's all about the emotion. Mm -hmm. If you can create the emotional connection, oh, that person's just like me. They have the same fears. They have the same issues. You create that a connection and now they want to follow you and learn more. Mm. Promoting yourself through your clients. I know, but it's but that's the thing that scares me. That my clients come to me not to be promoted, but to solve a problem. Mm -hmm. Like that, like I'm thinking, like if you guys, that's what I'm saying. Put yourself back into the position sure. of attorney. Somebody mm -hmm. comes to you because they screwed up. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, I'm gonna put you. My players don't come to me because they've screwed something up. Sure, they want to get better. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, they come to you and they're like, "I got an issue." Mm -hmm. Like you know, I watch Ray Donovan. I've got an issue. He's an attorney, but he's the fixer. I got an issue. They're not going to want the cameras there. They're going to turn that stuff off. I don't even want to know about this, especially in the politics world. I mean, yeah, we have a president in that, in that now. situation. You're not, you're not I know. Be able to do anything about that. Okay. I mean, you might be able to do a recap, not say who it was, but yeah. Or if the client got a positive outcome at the end, you can have them talk about it, which we often did as attorneys have a lot of people give testimonials, uh, testimonials about how it did, but you never have that, that before yeah. type. Picture. And testimonials in psychology with our ethics are tough because you don't want to make it an undue influence on somebody. Sure. But what's interesting to me, so I did a podcast. Um, there's a gentleman um, in Birmingham. His name's Cliff Sims. He wrote the book Team of Vipers, and he was Donald Trump's social media guy for 500 days. And it was fascinating because we started talking. Whether We're not going to go into a political discussion, but if you look at, to me, the politics of social media of Barack Obama contrasted with Donald Trump, all right? Don, uh, Barack Obama was the first person to ever come around who had a clear understanding of shaping psychology since the um, JFK era. Reagan was really good at it. Clinton did it his way with using media. Um, but Barack was, Obama was amazing at doing that. And Trump is amazing in the opposite way. 
he's I would say he's fantastic at shaping psychology as well though yes he's got half the country hating him half the country loving him and he loves the haters yeah mm -hmm. because they shout about him all the time how much how many billions of dollars of free media did he get in the last election he's been begging for an impeachment for two years yeah <laughs> oh yeah it's it's everywhere he's everywhere why wouldn't he be doing this so, he's he's going to sell something really big as soon as this is over oh yeah well they all do right yeah They're, all their memoirs are always multi billion bestsellers but cliff made a comment that said that that um and, and listen to the podcast if you haven't it is absolutely brilliant about a marketing and he runs a creative agency now in birmingham um but he said that that trump can't stand being irrelevant a lot of his tweeting comes about when he looks at tv and he is not the lead story he doesn't want to look at life and realize that he was an afterthought mm -hmm. He's always created this image of being the center of attention, but he's okay being the circus heel. Well, there's a saying that you die twice, once when your body drops and the second time, the last time someone says your name. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. So how much are you putting out there? How, how long are you going to continue after you're gone? He's going to be around a lot longer. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. What are we going to learn from him? And then let's just go there. What are we going to learn from him from a social media PR? Because to me, he's the greatest. I hate to, I mean, look. There's things I like about him, there's things I don't like about him. Okay, I'll just say that. I'm not going to go anywhere. Um, but he's the greatest PR president we've ever had. Absolutely. I absolutely agree so. with you. I think, I think one of the main points is uh, quantity. Quantity, quantity, quantity of content. Just keep putting it out there. Because and the, quality, the quality really doesn't matter. No, it doesn't. Because he puts out some stuff that you can't read. Spell. You can't read it. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it makes no sense whatsoever. But he's putting it out there and people are, what does this mean? We've got to talk about it now. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's single-handedly. I mean, if you look at it from a business, he's a zero-sum game guy. Mm -hmm. You lose, I win. Mm -hmm. That's all I care about. He's going to stack the deck to win. He will single-handedly pick apart his opponents and find their weak spot where it at. I mean, that's why people get so upset with him because he's they'll come across as being unpresidential. But he will find something in an opponent, find where they respond to it, and then just keep picking that scab. Yeah, because they're unlike him, they care about what their haters are saying. Yeah, they they great saw them. They have to defend themselves. Now they're in a defensive position, whereas he's always on the attack. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw him tweet after he won the election, as New York Times can thank me, because their subscriptions were almost gone, yep. and now they're making money. I mean, that's mm -hmm. it's funded New York Times, Washington Post, you know, <laughs> CNN, MSNBC. It's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Oh, newspapers dying. Has been for years. Yeah, but it's moved it to a different platform. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to be a hater. I don't want to be a hated person. So what do I learn from that? Be yourself. Just be yourself and don't care what anybody else has to say about you. There's going to be haters. There's going to yeah. be naysayers. There's people out there who are just negative mindset people that have to spread that to everybody they come in contact with. And we as, as people just have to make sure that we have our, our strong sense of self and don't let those little attacks damage our armor. But, but I'm thinking about like, in the professional golf world. Okay. One, it mis hits. one mistake on a tweet mm -hmm. could be, I mean. Oh, people will be all over you. Coaches lose jobs. You know, coaches in the NBA lose jobs. Coaches, because of a tweet. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I know there's certain areas you But it also go. doesn't mean they don't have a career after the tweet. So, yes, you, you can do something horrible to your career now as it is, but it doesn't mean there's not something next. Okay, I can, I can you, dig you can that. Transition. I can dig that, yeah. Yeah, I can dig that. I, I see that. But man, that's pain. Sure. And just because one school fires you or one team fires you doesn't mean you can't go to a different team where that culture kind of lines up with what you are. Mm -hmm. Hmm. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. It's just life moving you in the direction that you're meant to be in. Okay. So you guys made this entire switch. Mm -hmm. What do you want y'all's footprint to be on the industry? Um, so my, my niche is not sports. Um, mm -hmm. I, in a way, I, I focus on video gamers, actually. Really? I have a brand called The Gamer Premier. I saw that, yeah. Yeah. So I focus on business owners who are gamers. And that covers esports as well. So I do kind of do a little bit in the sports, you know, quote, sports arena. And it's quite interesting as it's the same as on the professional golf side. You have the coaches and you have the teams mm -hmm. and, and the training and facilities. And, it's, and, yeah, it's and events, you know, events with hundreds of thousands of people at it. You know, lots of money in these things. So um, my, my goal is to carve out my niche in the gamer space where I'm able to to focus on the business development which is something no one's done there no 
And for me, with, with the golfers, because I'm the one in the team who focuses on, on the sport of golf, it's, it's truly to reignite the passion for the game of golf. Because as we've heard for, for years and years now, golf is on the decline. Overall, the entire industry is losing money year over year. Viewership on the major networks of golfing events is down year over year. I think the PGA Championship was down 40% on television last year. Oh, it's horrible. But, but they just signed a massive new they, television deal. They did. They but did. they're moving the platforms, aren't mm-hmm. they? They're adjusting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I thought that they were going to go to a full PGA only platform. Okay. That was going to be like a icon on a page. But mm-hmm. but their answer was, you can't beat the power of CBS and NBC. You can't beat their money. Their money. Mm-hmm. That's exactly what it is. <laughs> yeah. But but they are going to have a complete coverage of all players for a couple of the events in 2020. I'm super excited about that because that means just huge amounts of video content for each of these players to be utilizing to promote themselves with. And that's the key. It's, it's the players that are going to drive the sport forward. It's mm-hmm. not the PGA. Well, it's funny because the PGA Tour used to be if you took your phone out, they'd kick you out. Now they, oh, want, I remember. Now they want your phone out. Mm-hmm. And I see that at Alabama football mm-hmm. you know, working there. It used to be, you pretty much didn't take your phone out because now they're like big media departments and video people walking around all the time. And it's almost, it's very weird to come from the old school, which was, (laughs) you know, secretive and quiet, Uh you know, I mean, shoot, you know, it's almost going to be that we're going to have sky cams and our pilots um, you know, and the military bombings. Uh, No, drones are perfect for that. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. (laughs) Yeah. Huh. Very interesting. All right. Somebody is listening to this. Let's give them. Let's give them some action steps. What are we going to do with them? Um, first thing I would say is, if, if you don't currently have social media at all, at least pick a platform. Who the hell are you then? Yeah, no. <laughs> so no, we've given, we've given presentations. We've we've done speaking engagements in front of groups where mm-hmm. we have to teach them how to do well, social my media. Wife, yeah. My wife. My wife has a Facebook. And the first question that we always ask is, who has? We'll name a bunch of platforms, and then who has the internet, and then who owns a computer? At the end, who owns a computer? There's actually still a few people who don't have their hands up iPad? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, yeah, if there's people out there who don't have these platforms still. Um, so if you Which find where your audience still is. still growing. Yeah, find oh, where your yeah. audience is, pick one platform to start with, and then post at least once a day. It's not hard. It's it, You can schedule on most can platforms. Can you post too much? No. Really, you can't. No. No. Uh, well, I, I will kind of waver on that, but I, I mostly, in, in uh, most, most cases, you cannot post too much. Okay. There, there's some situations. So like on Facebook, if you post more than twice a day in a, like a page, then they're going to start dinging your, your reach on that post. Exactly. So, um, but like on Twitter, there's, there's no reason yeah. not to post as much as you possibly can. Just free stream of consciousness yeah. on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. most, the average person has a couple hundred follower people they follow, um, up to thousands of people they follow. And so they're never going to see everything you post. If you post once a day or even once every couple days, the odds that that you know, anybody in your list saw it is really low. Mm-hmm. You just got to up, up your numbers. It's all about quantity. Okay, you're making me uncomfortable. <laughs> Why is that? You know, from a business, because I come from kind of the old school. Now, I see the value. I'm fascinated with this, okay? Mm-hmm. I, and I want to go to every conference there is on this, and I'm fascinated. Like, I love, um, you know, my social media influencers, or I mean, I love the Jesse Itzlers, I love the Sarah Blakeleys, I love the Rachel Hollises. We came to the Grant Cardone conference. We, you know, Lewis Howes, all these people, right? But I still go back to is a lot of them really don't see one-on-one clients. They're building an influencer mass. Sure. Do you got a book? Yes. The bigger your audience, the more books you can sell. Yes, I know that. It's, you know, you got a t-shirt, bigger your audience, more t-shirts you can sell. It doesn't have to be one-on-one. You can sell other stuff. Yeah. It's all a numbers game. It all comes down to a numbers game. You know, across industries, um, when you're trying to promote or sell something, you'll have about 10% of people show some kind of interest. Whether it's a, I'm going to click your link and see of what you're talking about. all the people who about. see it, 10% will have an interest in what you're talking we'll about. We'll take some kind of action, have some kind of interest. And then from there, only 2 to 3% of that is going to ever make a purchase from you. But this is these numbers are true across industries. So if you have the numbers, you know that you're going to ultimately make the sales. Now, to, to kind of winnow this down to people who have very small audiences. So like Diana has a very small, excuse me, I didn't mean to hit your mic there, yeah, right. a very small customer base because mm-hmm. she only works with PGA Tour pro golfers, right? LinkedIn is much better for people who have much, much more narrow 
subsets of customer bases because it's, it's the pro, quote professional network. And if you have their sales navigator system, it's like 80 bucks a month. You can find anybody. Oh, it's, it's, it's the coolest awesome. system. Yeah, I'll expand upon that a little bit. Yeah, go for it. Um, so you can you can target by their, yeah, their playing, job title, how long they've been at the job, um, how many people are in the company that they're at. Um, you can search by their name if you want. And if they have a LinkedIn account, they pop right up. Okay. And all you got to do is send them a message to connect. About 30% of everybody you reach out to is going to connect with you if they don't know you. Like she said, it's a numbers game. So this is Vegas. Yeah. It's a numbers game. Always. Mm -hmm. How many people can we get on the tables? Because we know we're going to win some, we're going to lose some. At least 51% of the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Th this is... The, the, so I'm, I'm playing podcast host, but I'm also listening as a business owner. Sure. Because this is the challenge that I've had. This is where I've wanted to go for five years, and I can't, it's so hard. What do you find is the hardest thing? I'm going to turn the tables and ask a question. I think the hardest thing is the implementation the consistent implementation across the execution. Because you know, we've, we've worked, I've had in-house people, I've had consultants. My time is, is, the, is only, is the resource that is there. Mm -hmm. And so content to me is king. And you know, I've always looked at it like a funnel, all right? So my outreach has gotta be, how many people's eyes can I get on the stuff that I believe is worthwhile? And I'm gonna say that as a quality control thing. I want people to find great content across multiple different things. If you're, an if you're a competitor in any part of your life, I can help you break your struggle. All right? I'm good at that. Okay, so what, how do I get you? Well, I think that I've got to create dissonance and cognitive dissonance in some areas. Mm -hmm. What you're doing and what you think you're doing and what needs to be done, we got a mismatch and I'm going to help you. But I'm not going to come out and say, you're doing it wrong because you're going to go, screw you. That's right. Okay. <laughs> so get them, get uh -huh. them to want to scratch that itch. I want yep. them, yeah. I call you it need to sell them on making the change themselves. Well, exactly. And that's a psychological, um, that's what we do in therapy all the time, right? Husband comes in because wife says he's an ass. The guy goes, ain't nothing wrong with me. That's a bad client if you go, what am I supposed to do? So you start f making them make it their idea. So I call it popcorn kerneling. I want them to have the popcorn kernel stuck in the back of their mouth. So three days later, they're like, that's what he's talking about. Okay, or 12 hours later. Like, it's like, oh, it reminded me. But the hard part is I want more people to come in and then we get them into the products we want to segment them into. Sure. But okay. the hard thing is, is I want, I, like, I love active social media. Love it. I'm a, convey, I'm a consumer of it. Okay. But I can't seem to find my groove. And now people listen to this. They're like, oh, no, I enjoy your stuff. Like I'll get people who say, man, I, I love what you do and all this. And I get Twitter is where I have my most traction because I can go on rants. But when I'm trying, I'm trying to do stuff in other areas, I feel like I try to be too polished. I try to do it right versus being authentic. And I'm a conservative guy. I mean, this is like a pretty relaxed, casual look for me. Um, you know, I, I'm not going to wear jeans and a t-shirt because I'm too overweight. You know, the t-shirt, that's not going to look good. You know, the hip look. But I don't have to be, you know, to me, the struggle in the social media is how authentic do we want to get? So it sounds almost like you're trying to have different branding for each platform. A little bit, not on purpose, but that's the struggle. Okay. Like, like Instagram for me, I think the greatest way is to say, here's, here's a a day in the life of. So... With Facebook and Instagram. But where am I taking them to in that? With Facebook and Instagram, you may not be as big as you are just because of the way the algorithms work. Yeah. And, you know, if you're not shown in the, in the search areas, if you're not featured, if they don't see your content, you're just not going to get the numbers. So, I mean, that's not necessarily your fault. It's just a matter of putting out more content. Yeah. Um, on Twitter, it's, I love Twitter. It's just, I do too. Just post as much as you want. It's, yeah. It's fantastic. But the same situation. Most people don't see your stuff. So you just got to post more. Um, your question was well, you, but it, you... but it's it's that match, right? I mean, so be, okay. be, do a plan. I'll, I'll your, your, your best bet is to create a plan in advance. Yes, I agree with that. So you, you're at the beginning of the new year right now. Plan your entire year out. We did that on Friday. Perfect. So, so we're there. We're and... okay. now. I create it all in advance as well. Yes. Okay. Create it all in advance, and then all you got to do is your maintenance. So I'm assuming Brett's posting Brett for you, and my daughter, and then you can post all the personal stuff that you want. So, um, for example, someone goes to a, a tour and they're a golfer, they can still be post or posting like they would normally do. And they don't have to worry about what their, their, um, their contractor is doing on the back end. They're just posting. Because they're always going to have a baseline of content and then they can just supplement as they okay. want. Okay. So does it look like, oh, that was a scheduled post? Who cares? Who cares? You don't care. 
Don't care. I, I'm gonna give you an, the, the other example. So I was I was meeting. <laughs> 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 Who invited you? <laughs> Thank you, Brett. <laughs> Comments from the peanut gallery. Yeah, who invited that guy? Okay, but I'll give you another example. I've got a friend of mine who owns a restaurant, and for the longest time, they didn't want their servers to walk around with their phones in their back pockets. Okay. Sure. I can understand why, because if your customer needs a drink and you're on your phone, they're not getting their and drink. so this question was, how do I post? And I'm like, well, you should hire... Well, I, I can't hire somebody who's going around as a social media... F- I think most businesses should have a full-time social media photographer. Graphic. Yes. I think kids, if you're listening to this, every kid in college should learn basic finance and you should also learn basic marketing skills. Oh, Photoshop, yes. video editing, and mm-hmm. stuff like that. That is a given in this next workforce. That's right. But they're like, I don't want people walking around with their phone because it looks bad. But you know what I mean? It does. Now, your, your restaurant server, if you can coach them to take a selfie with their families that they're serving, oh, wow, yeah, that might work. Mm-hmm. Mm. Because you just have to be creative. How, how do you make the system work for you today? You know, the, the, what's also happening is like, so we go to, we are in Cancun, all right, for the PJ Tour event. And I'm with one of my clients and we're having a big family, a big family, team family dinner. Right? Sure. My wife was there and everything. We walked out, none of us took a picture, none of us posted it. But <laughs> I, now, there was an audible you know, sigh in case so anybody didn't catch that. I'm, I'm a lot like you, Brett. I was actually pretty old school. I was a partner at a law firm at age 27 before social media was big. Yeah. So I had a radio ad. I had Yellow Pages ads. I had newspaper ads. I had everything that you know conventional businesses had. And then we left that and all the money was gone, right? We had to figure out what to do. So social media, once as soon as we figured out just how much value you can get out of it for you know, pennies on the dollar, you're getting what big corporations are spending millions of dollars on. It's a no-brainer to be there. Because mm-hmm. it's all just a numbers game. Okay. I, you know, I agree with you guys. I'm, I'm in full agreement. The hard part is the... Oh, man. The hard part is breaking away from the traditional way. And I know, look, 10 years from now, if I don't change, I'll be a dinosaur. So when you say breaking away from the traditional way... I really, I really have to ask you, where are your customers, though? Because that's the question that matters most. Where are your customers? Because if they're still on those traditional methods, be there. You don't have to be on social media if that's it not dep- where your customers it, it are. It depends on age. It depends on... Like, like I went to a, a, a very large seminar with one of my PGA Tour clients. He took me, and it was phenomenal. And he said, why don't... He was asking, why don't you do more? He goes, you know what? I get it. I understand it with our relationship. I don't want you out there. With, I don't ever want to worry that anything that I've ever said to you is going to end up on social media. And I went, well, you don't have to worry about that because my license is very, very important to me. I don't want to lose my license. Mm -hmm. Um, But he goes, yeah, but I know that now because I know you, but that would worry me. Like, I don't want to, and I was like, ooh, but that's the segmentation of my business, right? I don't really want to market to get more PGA Tour clients because they're going to find me naturally. Sure. There's nothing I can do besides good content. You know, it's really funny you mentioned that because as we uh, we market to PGA Tour professionals, we talk to their agents and they're like, so who do you work with? I'm like, yeah. well, we're not going to tell you because we're the voice. And, <laughs> well, we don't understand because it's social media. You, you should tell us who you work with. Yeah. No, that's not how this works. I know. And I go through the same thing. <laughs> I, and, and I ran into a golf, a very elite golf coach one time. And when I was first starting out, he says, we run into my wife's there. And he's like, who do you work with? I said, I don't divulge who I work with. And he went, oh, I know how you guys are. You want me to think you work with everybody, but you really don't work with anybody, and you're really a sham. And I was like, and I finally said, no, the guy that beats you in every tournament has been one of my clients since he was 14. Mm-hmm. Okay. And that one, I was like, look, he, the kid didn't care that I outed him. You know, because most of my kids don't care. I mean, they don't care, uh, kids. Most of my players don't care at all. I've got a few that will say, look, we're on a no one please let no one know mm-hmm. and i'm like even their colleagues don't know if we sure. walk by each other it's like we're the therapy oh we'd shout right. out from the rafters if we could who we work yeah. with oh right. i know but the uh we've talked to a couple of agents who have actually also been attorneys and mm-hmm. as soon as we say that uh they're like oh that's wonderful i absolutely get where you're coming from and i would expect it if mm-hmm. you represent my client to have the exact same non-disclosure and i don't want anybody to ever know that it's anybody but this player on the account mm-hmm. unless of course they choose to do some some branded looking content because they're selling something yeah but that's a hard thing right because at the same time the average consumer today wants to see oh and and unfortunately the uh, the sale is yeah, I mean, you walk by that person on the range, you took a picture, you put it on social media, and you're mm-hmm. claiming them as your client. Okay, I see that all the time. But 
I think what what's, what I've got to recognize is my PGA Tour work is with a very seg- segmented part of the population that I don't have to market for. Mm-hmm. I've got enough crossover credibility out of that. Where my business has to evolve into what I do is the work over here, which is selling other product services availabilities that I have for my clients. Mm-hmm. That I'm not, I'm not opposed to doing. Mm-hmm. It's that group. But most marketing people say, oh, we want to get into that. And I'm like, you can't get that. Even for Bama, for the longest time, I didn't even admit that I was the sports psychologist for the University of Alabama because until they were like, gave me a football one day, it said it, you know, for national championship ball or a, a ring. My wife's like, nobody cares. I'm like, but I do. I respect that. That's, that's the rub. You see what I'm saying? Sure. Yeah. Just giving insight to our listeners. So, uh, sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, tell people where they can learn more about you guys. Uh, we did it in the intro, but tell them, this is your chance to... Certainly. Um, you can always contact us through our website at www.forsocial.com. That's four is in the Gulf Four, F-O-R-E, social, S-O-C-I-A-L.com. And you'll do things outside of golf. Um, so I focus exclusively on the PGA Tour players. Okay. We do have a additional company between the two of us that does focus outside of the golf profession, but I personally focus on, on, golf. on the tour. Mm-hmm. Good. I want to thank you guys for doing this. this was extremely Absolutely, this exciting. was fun. It's a pleasure. This was fun. And, and <laughs> listen, listeners, I know that social media can be overwhelming and you have a choice to make. Either you embrace it or you think, as one of a PR person told me about 10 years ago, Twitter's only going to be around for six more months. Okay. If you fall into that trap, you are going to lose. The social media is how you get your brand out. You don't have to get your brand out to change jobs. You don't have to get your brand out to become bigger and stand on national stages. But you have clients that serve that you serve every day, and it could be your players, it could be your families, it could be your fan, it could be just business console, it could be sharing of, of content that you found important. But get out there and get yourself uncomfortable, because if you don't, the world's gonna leave you behind.